Hi, this is Carol Pope. Hi, I'm Kevin Staples. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to Rainbow, Rainbow Country, Country with Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. She is an award-winning journalist, writer, radio producer, podcaster, and she's also the radio programmer at CHMRFM in St. John's, Newfoundland. Today on Rainbow Country, Rhea Roman is my guest and joins me in conversation to talk about Canada's gender-affirming health care system. All that and more lies ahead on episode 307, so stay tuned. For Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hello, my name is Conchita. And I'm Barbecue. And my name is Hardcora. And we are the B Girls. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT FM in Toronto, and now proudly in syndication on 12 outlets across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately, listening. Together, we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, a number one LGBT podcast on Podomatic.com's Gay and Lesbian Chart. And by the way, last week, we were number two as well as being recognized as Canada's number two LGBT podcast on Feedspot.com. So today, trans filmmaker Chase Joint joins me to fill us in on Framing Agnes, Chase's latest award-winning trans documentary. Plus, in hour two, music from LGBT artists, independent artists, Voices that we've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. And on this episode, I'm featuring some classic funk, as well as a slew and abundance of LGBT artists. But up first, award-winning journalist Rhea Rollman gives us an update on her trans journey and so much more. All that lies ahead as we start off this brand new journey through Rainbow Country. Phone rings. I got a message from the mayor. He's going to call me back the next day. I get the call and he said, if you'd accept, uh, would you, we'd like to honor you with the key to the city. There was an event um, later that year in May. Just a key, right? Like key to what? A decent job, uh, a good singing career. Uh, it's really a metaphor, but it's history. So a reporter wants to talk to me and says, uh, you know, well, so it's key, right? Like, what's the big deal? I said, well, not everybody gets the key. So I looked it up, and I guess it is kind of a big deal. The date, May 17th, 2018, when trans activist Susan Gapka made history by becoming the first trans woman to be presented with the key to the city of Toronto. By the way, past recipients include Rush and the Raptors. Hi everyone, this is Mark Tewksbury, Olympic champion, leader, humanitarian. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Rhea 
Jay Rollman, hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I am well. Thank you for being here to have your voice, your story be heard by the by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you for that. Uh, you are an award-winning journalist. You are a writer. You are a radio program director. You're the program director for CHMR FM in Newfoundland, uh, Newfoundland's only alternative. How, how long have you been there? How long have you been program director there? Oh, golly. Um, I have been um, back in this job around five years, I guess. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> the, the whole pandemic has been kind of a blur um but you know we're our studios are back open we've we've got all our our djs and programmers back in the studio again now so it's starting to feel alive again okay summer 2021 uh transforming transition related surgeries in newfoundland this is an article that you wrote in summer 2021 for the independent.ca first of all the the independent.ca what is the independent talk to me about this this publication oh it's it's our our primary uh independent media source in newfoundland and labrador um it was a print newspaper uh back in the early 2000s um but it was a for-profit print newspaper and then it it didn't make a profit and shut down. Um, and then it was revived in 2011 by a group of new writers and was redesigned as a kind of a media co-op, more or less. And uh, that's when I got involved uh, as a writer and editor. And um, so, yeah, we we cover news, culture, um, all the stuff that the mainstream commercial media in the province does not cover. And, and, you know, like most places, we're losing a lot of media in the province. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, local media. Yes. You know, I mean, yeah, they're all being, uh, you know, bought up by, by national companies operating out of, you know, Nova Scotia or Toronto. And uh, even CBC is scaling back operations. It's really sad. Mm -hmm. So transforming transition-related surgeries in Newfoundland like I, I mentioned, this is an article you wrote in, in summer 2021. This article that you wrote, what is this article, at the heart of this article, what are you getting at? Well, I, I started digging into it after my own experience, uh, trying to um, access, uh, you know, after I came out as trans and, and started trying to access uh, transition-related surgeries. And it was really hard. Um and I was surprised because everyone told me, you know, um, great timing <laughs> uh, to come out as trans because Newfoundland overhauled its policies around transition surgeries in 2019. So I was told, you know, it's great. Everything's covered. It's going to go great. That's not the case. Um, <laughs> uh, the the policy overhaul that happened in 2019 um, there are a lot of gaps that still remain. And, uh, and, and so that's what I, I tried to dig into to figure out what are those gaps? What's not working about the system? You know, why? Uh, you know, what is the fine print that's preventing so many people from accessing uh, transition related surgeries and medical supports in our province? Um, so so that, that's what I dug into for that piece. And you wrote this article in hopes of what? Well, I think in hopes of drawing awareness to the mm. problems, uh, ultimately in hopes of changing, <laughs> you know, I, I, I really wanted to flag. And a lot, the problem is a lot of folks like tr trans healthcare in Canada is so confusing. It's, you know, um, because every province has its own policies around what it covers, what it doesn't cover, how it covers it. Um, so it is incredibly confusing for a lot of folks to figure out, you know, what, what, what's covered? You know, how do I access gender affirming health care? A lot of doctors don't understand it either. You know, um, some newer doctors in some med schools are getting some exposure to trans health care, but a lot are not. And there's a lot of people in the system already, doctors who have been practicing for years, who get actually frightened when uh, trans patients come to them, or when their current patients come out as trans, and they say, oh, I don't know how to support you. I don't know how to, how to treat, you know, how to prescribe hormones or how to monitor your blood work or, or, or to access surgery. And, and they try to 
put their patients off on 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 other doctors. Um, so so there's a lot of problems when it comes to gender affirming healthcare in this country. Uh, so I, I really hope that. Um, you know, the more we understand what the problems are, where the disconnects are, um, I, I hope that governments, policymakers, activists will start changing, you know, will start improving access and care. So transition related surgeries uh, change sex characteristics to affirm a person's gender identity. Yes. So what are these characteristics that you talk about in in the article well the um uh, see see the problem especially for some of our, our you know smaller provinces like newfoundland and labrador is that a lot of the surgeries folks want to access they're, they're not available in the province so the, the specific surgeries you know that i, I talked about in the article um People colloquially, you know, refer to them as, as top surgery or bottom surgery. Uh, but we're talking about, you know, um, uh, chest masculinization, you know, for, for transmasculine or non-binary folks uh, or, or breast augmentation for uh, trans feminine, you know, uh, people. Um, uh, those would be like the top surgeries, um, some of the more common ones. And then, you know, bottom surgeries can include um, vaginoplasty or phalloplasty. Um, and, and, you know, various associated surgeries, um, to, to those. And, and there's also, uh, stuff that's, that's done above the neck, like the neck up as well, isn't there? Yes. And I, actually, I'm glad you reminded me because that's a really important part. Um, there, you know, like facial feminization surgery, for example, um, you know, which is something that very few jurisdictions will cover under public health care. Uh, the uh, Yukon recently brought in a policy that they do cover it, but most, uh, and, I, and I think there's actually a, um, a human rights challenge in Nova Scotia to try to get it covered, but most provinces do not uh, cover uh, facial feminization surgery, for, for instance. And, and there's also things like, you know, tracheal shave uh, to, to affect your voice change, uh, or even even hair implants, you know, um, or laser hair removal, uh, electrolysis, all of these kinds of surgeries that help folks, um, you know, uh, affirm their gender identity, you know, through their physical embodiment. And and just so that I, I understand, these are all maybe available or not available, depending on the, the province you live in? That's correct. Um, for, so, for example, in Newfoundland, uh, the only surgery that is available is uh, breast augmentation. There is one surgical clinic that offers that. Uh, so, so, but it's a private clinic. It's not covered by the public health care system. So if you want to access that, you've got to pay eight to ten thousand dollars out of your own pocket. Um, for chest masculinization surgery, uh, that is th- that is covered by the Newfoundland government. Uh, however, there's no surgeon who offers it in province. So Newfoundland will send patients to New Brunswick where there is a surgeon who does that surgery for them. Um, bottom surgery is not available in the province. So patients are sent to Montreal uh, for that. That is covered uh, by the government, but uh, patients are sent to Montreal. And when I say that's covered by the government, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm speaking quite loosely. The government says they cover it, but the reality is that there are uh, patients wind up being stuck with a lot of out of pocket costs, mm-hmm. which is one of the barriers. And when you say out of pocket costs, what do you? What sort of costs are you talking about? Like, are you talking about travel, hotel, that sort of thing? Yes, yes. That so uh, two examples um, for chest masculinization surgery, for instance. Uh, the government policy says it's covered. However. They only cover the the removal of the breasts. They do not cover. Um, a lot of patients need to get liposuction and chest contouring done as well. That's not covered. So that'll often cost patients about four thousand dollars. It's part of the same procedure, but it's not covered. So so patients who are going for that surgery wind up uh, getting this four thousand dollar bill. Um, for um, for surgery, for example, when I went for uh, for vaginoplasty in Montreal, um, transportation is, is 
partially covered. And that's a problem. A lot, you know, a lot of people are told government will cover everything, but for surgeries that don't happen in the province, which is most of them, um, government has what they call the Medical Transportation Assistance Program. And what folks discover when they actually try to go for surgery is that it's it's a cost share program. So uh, government only covers half of your travel and accommodation expenses, um, which, uh, you know, that, that can be, uh, again, a bill in the thousands of dollars, depending on where you're going and how long you have to be there for the surgery. Uh, Ria, you just mentioned about your 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 surgery in in Montreal. Uh, I have a question for you in regards to being open about talking, uh, you know, about these sort of things, because Laverne Cox is uh, had an interview with um, Katie Couric, where mm-hmm. Katie Couric was asking about you know, that sort of thing on her talk show uh, with with Laverne Cox. And Laverne Cox, you know, shut it down, right? And mm-hmm. you just, you know, felt free enough, I guess, to, to mention going to Montreal and uh, as part of your journey. How, how do you feel about talking... And people talking to you about that in interviews, what have you? Because when I saw that interaction between Laverne Cox and Katie Couric, I I can understand on one hand where Laverne Cox was coming from, but at the other hand, the other part too is we can't necessarily understand something unless we we talk about it in a respectful way and we kind of, you know, dispel the myths and shine light into something that people don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about. How do you land on this? That's an interesting question. Um, I I guess on on the one hand, yeah, I can also understand why someone would want to not not have that conversation. Um, I think sometimes, you know, some people, including media personalities, you know, they, they really sensationalize the, um, the, I don't know what, the, the medical side of things, you know, the surgeries and stuff. And, um, uh, you know, I, I can understand how that can really make people uh, feel unpleasant, you know, when, when that is, when, when interviewers dwell on that to the exclusion of all else, you know? Um, but I, but I also, I agree with you. I mean, when I came out, I kind of, uh, like in an ideal world, I, I would, you know, love to just, uh, not have to talk about any of this stuff, but, but I also do recognize that, I mean, here in Newfoundland, we've, there is such poor, um, state of trans healthcare that that we have to talk about it you know and I, I agree we have to educate people um so so that so that they you know understand what these surgeries are that so that they understand what gender affirming health care means mm-hmm. um I, I think yeah dispelling the fear and the confusion and the uncertainty is important and i also think that you know and the uh, ignorance uh, around everything Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause, cause I think that is what leads, well, I don't think it's what leads to a lot of the really horrific, you know, things we're seeing for instance, in the U S but, but I think it feeds it, you know um, it, it, it helps th- that kind of transphobia spread. Mm. Um, and you can't, I, I and also, you can't, I don't mean to, to jump in on you, yeah. but we can't dispel ignorance by shutting something down. You can only dispel ignorance by bringing something to the light and talking about it, in my opinion, in an honest and respectful way. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think it's important as well to when we try and avoid having these conversations, um, it, it, it makes people think that there's it, sometimes it can make people lend, lend the impression that there's something to be ashamed of or something mm-hmm. to be fearful of. You know, there, there's not like, a, you know, being trans is absolutely fantastic. It's not something to be worried about or afraid about or, or, or ashamed about. It's it's great. And I mean, you know, I I I have the highest praise for the the surgical clinic where I went to, you know, it was, I I mean, obviously recovery was an ordeal, but um, you know, it was, it was great service, great support. Um, It was, uh, if you have to have a medical procedure, it was a great all around experience, you know? (laughs) 
So, Ria, for yourself, when did you come out as trans? I came out uh, in, I think it was 2019. <laughs> uh, the pandemic makes time a blur. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was yeah early 2019. And had you always, let me, let me ask it this way. When did you start recognizing this about yourself? Like for me as a gay person, I've always known I was gay. Like ever since I was like, you know, four or five or something, I've even got photos of me being a little, you know, Mm -hmm. a little drama queen, so to speak at a real young age. And for yourself and your, your gender identity, when did you, that start coalescing and materializing for you that you were transgender? When did this start, all start happening for you? Oh, it was in grade four. Mm. I, you know, I, I remember, <laughs> liter- I remember the literal moment, you know. What that was that moment? Uh, it was this strange moment where the we were chatting with the teacher, you know, I think it was during lunch or something. And, you know, the teacher was having one of these conversations. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I just had this jarring realization that when I saw myself in the future, you know, trying to picture the future me in some career, I I could only picture a woman. And it was really jarring and strange to me, you know, Um, and, and like, literally, it felt like kind of this glass ceiling kind of breaking, you know, that when I thought about it, because it it really kind of hit me to my core. And, uh, you know, that and then I, I struggled to kind of understand what that was and, and come to, you know, what did it mean? <laughs> um, this was, you know, pe- people didn't talk openly about trans identities at this time. So it took me several years to realize, oh, there is this thing called transgender. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, this was in Newfoundland where we had a, you know, I mean, we had horrifically homophobic, transphobic teachers. I did in school, you know. Um, so uh, it, it took, you know, several years to, to really put the exact words to it. But yeah, the realization was there very early on. And on that note, we will return after this Rainbow Country update. Hi, I'm Cameron Bailey, Artistic Director and Co-Head of TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Celebrate Canada Day this year with Laughs, the A Comedy Tour. Canada's homegrown international comedy tour is going coast to coast to celebrate Canada Day long weekend. We have shows kicking off in St. John's, Newfoundland, Toronto, Ontario, Cambridge, Ontario, Loretto, Ontario, and finally Vancouver, BC. Our shows are featuring some of the best comedians in the country, including Juno Award winner for Best Comedy Album 2022, Andrea Jin. Nima Naz, known for his hilarious sketches, and Andrew Packer, with over 1.3 million followers on TikTok. These shows are going to be hilarious, and all ticket info can be found on Linktree backslash A Comedy, that's E H Comedy, or on Eventbrite.ca. Come have a laugh. Our Health, a Canada wide 2S LGBTQQIA plus community survey is looking for your involvement. The Our Health survey aims to explore the current state of health among two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, and other sexually and gender diverse people in Canada. The study team especially wants to hear from community members who are living with chronic health conditions like diabetes, cancer, and fibromyalgia. This is to ensure that people living with conditions that are often underrepresented or less understood are included in this work. Participants will also have the opportunity to do a test at home to screen for COVID-19 antibodies, HIV, hepatitis C, and syphilis. 
All data collected will be used to advocate for programs, services, and policies that better support the health and well-being of 2S LGBTQQIA plus people across Canada. All participants will receive a small honorarium for completing the survey. For more information, visit cbrc.net forward slash our underscore health. That's cbrc dot net forward slash o u r underscore h e a l t h. Summer is in the air, and here's what's on tap for summer 2022. Deep Throat, the 1972 porn classic, comes to Rainbow Country. The little film that helped to create the porn industry and become intimately entwined in American politics. Watergate. All that and more coming up on summer 2022, right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, I'm Saida Garrett, co-writer of Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. And you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mr. Mark Tara. Twenty twenty one was a big year for you. You you penned that that article, but you also mentioned going to Montreal to you know as part of your journey.、Uh -huh. And you you also had to raise money, did you not? I did, yeah. And you know, and like, this is、like、because I mean of what you're talking about in the article that some things are covered and other things aren't covered. Exactly. Yeah,、um, you know, and and it didn't really hit home until I, I got the call from the clinic wanting to schedule the surgery.、Mm. <laughs> This is another issue, you know.、Um, the waiting lists are quite long for a lot of these surgeries, so there's a there's a level of unpredictability. You know, you、are、never know. Years. Yeah, yeah, you know, it,、uh, I was you know on on the list for、uh, waiting list for what one two years, I guess.、Mm -hmm. um, And and different procedures, different clinics can take longer、uh, as well.、Um, but once I got the call, I realized, okay, I you know I have to book my flights.、Um, I have to、uh, for for bottom surgery.、Um, you're allowed to bring. You're actually、um, advised to bring an escort with you because you're not in you know much of a state to <laughs> look after yourself. You know for、uh, during your return travel.、Um, So you know, we had to arrange flights, accommodations, all that stuff. Get time off work,、uh, make arrangements. You know, for well, months off work for recovery.、Um, and that's when I realized I don't know if I can afford this. <laughs> you know,、um, and so I, I was, I actually had to、um, delay my original surgery date by a little while、um, to, to to make all these arrangements,、uh, and then I had to figure out where to come up with the money. And I,、uh, some you know, some friends advised me, you know, do a GoFundMe.、Um, this is how some other trans friends of mine had funded their surgeries. I, I felt so awkward, you know. It's it's hard to go to the public, you know, your friends,、um, and publicly ask for money. <laughs> you know, it's it it you really feel afraid doing that. You know, it's really making yourself vulnerable、uh, in a really deep way. But I didn't see any alternative, so、um, I, I did, and I was so lucky. You know,、um, folks donated.、Um, I think hundreds of people、uh, donated funds, and I was able to book the flights and make you know make all the bookings and、uh, and make it to Montreal for my surgery.、Um, I was really thankful, and I was really lucky. You know, not, unfortunately, not everyone is is able to、uh, raise funds that way. Uh, it's not really a sustainable model for healthcare, <laughs> you know, online fundraisers. But、um, I was quite fortunate. And, and the place that you went was this a private clinic? Yeah, there's, there's, well, 
historically there's there's been one clinic that offers um uh, vaginoplasty in Canada. It is a private clinic in Montreal, but because it's the only clinic in the country, uh, government, um, you know, allows it to be covered under public health care. Um, now there are, I think there is, a, there are two brand new teams, uh, medical teams starting to offer the surgery in Toronto and Vancouver. Uh, but Montreal has been the go-to spot, um, generally speaking for, for people in Canada mm-hmm. going for that surgery. And, this clinic offer you any guidance or suggestions when it came to how to cover the costs that weren't covered? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, broadly speaking, no. <laughs> that's that's pretty much up to uh, the the patients, mm-hmm. you know. Now they did make a suggestion, which is uh, actually I'm glad you raise it because it is important to mention. Um, there there is a a shadowy organization, but a very good organization uh, in Canada called Hope Air. Um, And, uh, you know, the the clinic actually told me about it and said that if I was having financial difficulty, this group had helped other people. I I felt I didn't know anything about them. I, I felt, you know, the little I was able to learn about them, it sounded like they were um, kind of a, a support group for, I don't know, I assumed you had to be in some kind of really uh, poverty stricken situation to access them, partly because there was not a lot of information about them publicly available. Um, I have since talked to folks who have uh, managed to get um, support through them. So, so yeah, they're, they're, they're a national charity. They help with medical travel, not just for trans people, but for anyone who needs to travel for medical reasons in Canada. Um, and uh, I do know a few trans people locally who have had all of their travel and accommodations covered by Hope Air. I, I feel I have mixed feelings about this. I mean, I'm glad on the one hand that it exists and offers this service. Um, the fact that you know, that they don't really advertise their services means a lot of people miss out on on this, um, kind of like I did. Um, And also, like, governments pay millions of dollars, donate millions of dollars to this organization. And I just find it rather ironic that governments will donate to a charity to help people travel for medical expenses, but they governments won't actually make it accessible within their own internal policies, you know, um, their own provincial healthcare systems. Uh, so yeah, so, so that is a, a charity that, that does help folks out um, if, if they have no other route for covering uh, medical travel. So a statistic from the Canadian Psychiatric Association, 77% of transgender individuals seriously consider suicide, 43% attempted suicide. Do those stats surprise you? No, they, they, they don't, sadly. Um, one of the reasons, one of the things that, you know, kept me in the, in the closet for so long, like I, I, two trans people I knew or growing up, um, um, killed themselves. Uh, so, so I, I had kind of, you know, I, 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 I had seen firsthand, I guess, how uh, the impact gender dysphoria can have when you're not able to get the supports um, and, and, you know, yeah, the, the supports. Uh, and, you know, I'm, well, a, pr- a project I'm working on right now is researching um, uh, the queer history here in the province. And it is, it is so jarring and shocking out of a lot of the early trans activists that I've been reading about, you know, from the 1990s, uh, how, how many of them are not with us and, and, and so many of them, you know, died tragically early and, and it's, you know, the, the struggle really took a, its toll on them. Uh, so, so unfortunately I'm not surprised. Um, you know, it really speaks to how important it is to make sure that uh, gender affirming healthcare is available and accessible to people. You know, it, it's the, 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 the medical supports 
you know, we, we have them, <laughs> they're there, you know, and, and they can do amazing help when people access them. Uh, the, the, so it's, it's really infuriating that governments continue to make it so difficult for folks to get these very effective supports um, that, that are out there. So transforming transition related surgeries in Newfoundland, this article that you wrote in summer of 2021 is this article based on your own personal journey? It was, in, I mean, I, I didn't research, I didn't focus on myself because <laughs> um, I wanted to be, it to be more objective, but it, it was inspired by my journey. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, that's what drove me to, to start researching the subject and writing about it. But I, I spoke to other folks about their experiences, you know, patients and medical practitioners. Uh- and since it's been out, because it's been it's been out about a year, yeah. Since it's been out, how's the response been? Um, g- good, I suppose. Uh, I, I think. Have you gotten feedback at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of folks uh, have have expressed that. You know that there's a lot of mystification around things like what is covered, what is not covered, why is it covered, how is it covered. So I think you know articles like this that really kind of lay it out, <laughs> find the answers. Uh, so many of these answers are, are just hidden <laughs> and, uh, and not accessible to the public. So I think, you know, getting the answers to these questions um, is, is, you know, helps people to at least understand, you know, how things currently stand when it comes to gender affirming healthcare um, and gives people a basis on which to figure out, okay, what do we need to change? You know, um, unless we understand what it is that's not working about a policy, we can't figure out how to change that policy, you know? So uh, I, so yeah, so I, I, I think and hope it's created a foundation for activists to push for, for practical changes. Are you writing a book? I am. Yeah. On? <laughs> uh, on uh, the, the queer history of Newfoundland in the 20th mm. century. Mm. Um, and how's, how is that going? It's, it's, it's exciting. It's mm-hmm. uh, taken over my life. <laughs> um, it's been kind of my pandemic project. Um, mm. I, so I actually, I guess I, I became interested in, in the, the subject Oh, some years ago, uh, I, I, I was helping out organize one of the uh, St. John's Pride uh, festivals, and we were trying to figure out, you know, okay, what, how, what number Pride is this? You know, how long has Pride been celebrated in St. John? No one knew. And so I, I hit the archives to try to figure it out. And um, <laughs> I, I went to our, our local archives, and they had this worn dog-eared um file folder that was labeled homosexuals <laughs> and um <laughs> and uh it was basically all these newspaper clippings uh that someone that had been collected over the years about you know queer anything <laughs> mm-hmm. and I, I knew i i just lost an entire day pouring through these news articles like learning yeah. so much um and i remember thinking at that point gosh, you know, someone needs to write a book about this uh, before all these articles like dissolve into dust. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, when the pandemic hit uh, and I had a lot more, you know, spare time uh, locked down, I decided that now's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So is there, do you have a a release date in mind, a time frame? Uh, Yeah, well, I've, uh, been so so initially I, I did like archival work and then I started reaching out to some of the activists and and just folks who lived here uh, so I, I've been interviewing uh, people who are around during the time um, and I'm trying to clue up my interviews now <laughs> um, it's like you know you you interview one person then they introduce you to three more people um, so I've, I've got geez I've done I guess upwards of 70 interviews now with different queer elders uh from from the 20th century and uh i'm you know hoping to get the draft in in the next couple of months and uh we're hoping to get the book out before the end of the year wow our optimistic goal (laughs) wow and how do you feel about that will this be your first book it will yeah yeah um i'm really excited you know Mm -hmm. like i i have learned so much um 
uh, like there is just such a rich and vibrant queer history in Newfoundland that I never knew was there. Um, you know, it's been amazing reading about activists back in the seventies, you know, and, and just the community that existed back in the seventies. And um, how it, far back have you been able to trace? Oh my goodness. So the, the, the first kind of official uh, queer organization was founded in 1974 in, in St. John's, uh, uh, but I mean, there are queer, you know, they're gay and lesbian people. I have traced back to the 1800s. Um, <laughs> you know, there was very eccentric uh, out um, uh, American, actually, who moved here in the 1860s. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's he was a character. <laughs> um, and then in the early 20th century, uh, you know, there are um, I was reading today about, you know, a couple of lesbian nurses in World War I. Um, uh, like there, there's just such a vibrant history. Um, and I, I mean, one of the early markers, just to give you a sense, um, in 1925, uh, there was a, a priest in Trinity Bay who wrote for the, the, the big St. John's newspaper. And uh, he, he wrote this kind of op-ed uh, where where he reflected on World War One that had just happened, and and then he started say writing about how you know there's folks who look down on on men who how did he put it like the the love of David for Solomon <laughs> I think is is what they the the old euphemism you know um, men uh, who express love for each other uh, but he says you know we just got through this massive, terrible war, you know, and, and in the face of all that, this war and destruction that plagues the world, what's wrong, you know, why should we feel so bad about, you know, when, when people find love, isn't that what matters? And shouldn't we respect it no matter what form love takes? Uh, so, I mean, this is someone writing back in 1925 um, in a public newspaper in Newfoundland. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of stuff is really exciting to see. Any thoughts? While you were talking to me, I'm like having all these images pop into my mind. So (laughs) have you thought uh, or entered, you know, have yourself entertained the thought of potentially at some point this might be a documentary? Oh, uh, that would be really exciting too. I I haven't thought about it. No, uh, Mm. that's not really... Uh, I guess, you know, um, film is not something one, I've done. Uh, but one thing that, at a time. Yeah. One thing I am uh, kind of working on at the same time is putting together a walking tour uh, here mm. in St. John's of queer history. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping to actually get that on the go this summer. That's uh, a great idea. Yeah. You'll have to come and uh, and see all the spots. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, uh, I can absolutely see a documentary of that, of what you're talking about, you know. That would be great. I mean, yeah, yeah I yeah. would love to see that happen. So do you have a working title or something for this this novel, this book? Not a novel, but this book? Uh, yeah, we've been... <laughs> I, I, my early working title was a queer history of Newfoundland, but mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure how queer it is in a theoretical sense. I, you know, it's more of a straightforward history. So we're, we're now looking at uh, uh, queer Newfoundland, uh, a, um, a history of community and activism. Mm. Love it. Whatever you decide, it will be fantastic. Thank you. I'm looking I have forward. no doubt. I have no doubt. Maybe even a, uh, uh, some sort of a, a radio special. Yeah, I was hoping you might, you might do. Yeah, yeah, a radio, yeah, documentary would be really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Especially since since a lot of the, these activists are still around, you know, it would be great to, you know, I, I've had the fortune to talk to them, but I think it would be great to let others uh, hear their stories firsthand mm. as well. Your your interviews are they? Are you recording them? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, hey, 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 CHMR FM. <laughs> there just might be uh, some sort of a, a multi-part series there. That would that would be great, you know. You never know. Yeah. I think it's so important <laughs> to, like, document these, these histories because they can so easily be lost, you know. Uh, so I'm really glad that I've been able to, to talk to these people about about their lives and uh, yeah, and yeah, get get all this wonderful information down to document, to uh, archive, but to also to share. 
Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, because yeah. we have to know our history because a lot of times it just gets, you know, it goes unrecorded. Absolutely. Like, and, and, and there's so many times when, when I've told, I've reached out to people to interview and I've, I've told them I'm writing, you know, a book on Newfoundland's queer history. And they'll say, oh, it must be a really small book. <laughs> but no, you know, like there is such a, a deep, vibrant history. And I, I just want it all to be documented and shared with the world. Rhea Roman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Mark. Women's College Hospital in Toronto is helping to pioneer transgender health care in Canada by offering gender-affirming surgeries. In 2019, Women's College Hospital began offering its gender-affirming programs, becoming the first public hospital in Canada to do so. Mind you, when it comes to waiting times for gender-affirming surgeries, for upper surgeries, it can be one to two years, and for vaginoplasty, up to five years. To read Rhea Roman's article, Transforming Transition-Related Surgeries in Newfoundland, simply head over to theindependent.ca and search Transforming. My name is Charles Officer, and I'm the writer and director of Invisible Essence, The Little Prince. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Up next, filmmaker Chase Joint talks about the new trans documentary, Framing Agnes. I first encountered Agnes in graduate school. I read a case study about a young trans girl in the 1950s who lied her way into the UCLA gender clinic to get access to surgery. And I remember reading it and thinking, this whole thing is a lie. You know, I remember thinking, this passage is a lie. It's not telling the real story. The flip for me to the talk show is in part a nod to the fact that I think from many people of our generation, the talk show was the place where many of us first encountered gender nonconforming subjects. You might be wondering where people go when they are experiencing problems of a sexual nature. An experimental research team at UCLA is interviewing dozens of people about emerging problems of sex and gender. It's wild to be a part of a project like this that kind of blows open a vault. Your parents must be a little overwhelmed by your desire for all these changes. Yeah, well, you know, they're old people. I have a friend, she's like me, and she helped me take a position as a receptionist at a hair salon. Does the owner know about you? They know I can type. I put a bit of paint over the F on my driver's license, but the police scraped it off. They asked me, are you a man or a woman? And I said, well, that's a matter of opinion. We have heard the story told by the hunter and not by the lion and not by the lions who not only fought back but got away. I have a tricky relationship to the truth for myself. We've all been misled so many times. How do you justify the lies? How do you justify your questions? Chase Joint, hi, how are you? I'm great, so happy to be here. I have to say thank you so much for your time, for being here, to have your voice, your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond, especially to talk about Framing Agnes. This is your current film, your current documentary. Talk to me about the story that you're telling within Framing Agnes. So Framing Agnes takes up these never-before-seen case files from a moment in the late 1950s at the UCLA Gender Clinic where a sociologist named Harold Garfinkel was 
interviewing various trans and gender non-conforming and non-binary people. And the project asks contemporary trans luminaries and performers to, to walk toward these historical subjects to unpack a whole host of questions from what it means to be represented to the relationship between media and medicine and the ways in which these institutions make meaning about trans and gender nonconforming lives and argues for a kind of unknowability or an opacity or a privacy as a, a mode of political power in this particular moment. <sighs> So based on transcripts from the the 1950s, uh, from a UCLA study, uh, in a nutshell, do you know what was going on within the study? Yeah, so, you know, Harold Garfinkel in particular was a young sociologist, and he was, in some ways, looking to develop uh, a more expanded theory of passing. And so he attaches to a person named Agnes of our title because she becomes for him an exceptional case study in gender passing. We can think about racial passing, vocational passing, all the other ways in which that, that word gets mobilized. But Garfinkel was a part of an interdisciplinary team of other researchers, psychologists, sociologists, who are all collaborating around a set of shared questions about what we might you know, recognize as problems of sex and gender. You went to UCLA. I did indeed. Is this where and how you heard about this? Or did you know about uh, all of this and Agnes beforehand? Well, it's a little bit of a long story, but I will do my best to summarize it quickly, which is to say, while I was an undergraduate at UCLA, I became friends with a person named Kristen Schilt, who at that time was a graduate student in the Department of Sociology, where Harold Garfinkel was still emeritus before he passed in 2011. And Kristen and I have now had a 20 year long friendship and through a fellowship that we received at the University of Chicago, began to think together about the legacy of the case study of Agnes in sociology. And because we're geeks and we like hanging out and troubling over the same questions, we managed to find our way into the private archival holdings of Garfinkel after his death. And it's there where we unearthed the transcripts, which then unlocked the potentials of the project. There are audio tapes, correct? Mm Mm-hmm. With and in framing Agnes in the documentary, there's one moment where there is a bit of, uh, I guess it's it's Agnes talking. It is indeed. Yeah. Talk to me about how you found these audio tapes and what went through your mind when you did find them. So one of the extraordinary things about Harold Garfinkel is that he was an obsessive archivist, and so he recorded every conversation that he had. He kept every draft of every paper that he had ever authored. And when Kristen and I approached the archive, to be perfectly frank, it wasn't an archive. It was a storage facility full of his belongings. And so as part of the work, as part of our contribution to the work, we began to organize and categorize boxes and piles and ephemera. And throughout the boxes, we would pull papers into one pile and tapes of a variety of different styles and formats into another pile. And at the time of our investigations, none of it had been digitized, none of it had been restored. And we were actually just very lucky through a series of fortunate events to gain access to that scrap recording, which we know to be Agnes, but there is so much more that is is not explored um, in his collection that I'm sure would reveal all other kinds of pathways for for future project creation. So Framing Agnes features a a number of trans subjects that were part of this study, Uh, an older trans man, trans women, a trans teenager. How did you decide who you would feature in Framing Agnes. So our film includes the stories of six people and we gained access to eight. And we didn't choose to include the latter two because there wasn't enough information to build 
any kind of attempt at a portrait. And it felt unethical to include the story of someone who perhaps passed through the office once looking for a very particular piece of information and then went on their way. We really wanted to spend time with those who had returned to Garfinkel's office and therefore allowed us to have a, a richer and more dynamic engagement with their opinions and their history. So there's Agnes, and then there's Georgia, mm -hmm. a black trans woman played by Angelica uh, Ross, who people might know from Pose. Georgia, I guess, was, or maybe Georgia may still be alive, I don't know, a black trans woman in the 50s. What went through your mind when you found that story? about a, a, I mean, a black trans person, a black trans woman in the 50s. I mean, one of the things that we know as a foundational um, set of commitments and knowledges is that trans people have always existed and that it's through the violent, racist, exclusionary forces of institutions like medical establishments and like research institutions that racialized and otherwise minoritized characters disappear from the record, right? And so to find Georgia's transcripts, words, feelings in the archive was an extraordinary opportunity to think about the violence of this kind of approach to research and to archives more broadly, but also to invest in the extraordinary access and life-giving that we have when we are allowed to live alongside her words. And I think one of the things that Jules Gill Peterson does so beautifully in the film is draws our attention to these attachments. Who do we need from history and why? And who I need might be different than who you need or approach and how can we actually sort of wrestle and sit with that tension recognizing that the archive is always incomplete and the archive is already a curated moment where all of those people georgia agnes everyone else who arrives in our film is performing a very particular version of themselves for a very particular reason and so part of the work of the film yes is to spend time with the archive but to also be reckoning and asking these broader questions of what we expect access to actually afford us chase joint thanks for your time well said well done well made thank you so much love our chats i first encountered agnes in graduate school I read a case study about Framing Agnes is currently on the film festival circuit. For more information, framingagnes.com. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing, based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill. But without some progressive conservative legislators' backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. Hi, I'm Keegan Hurst, former professional rugby player, coach, raving homosexual, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Mm. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station, uh, specifically for our issues, to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the to the issues that matter to us. 
and of course our artists and and um, the things that we do globally and and talk about culture and without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with with a radio show like this then uh, we wouldn't have that voice so support tune in thank you And just like that, this little gay journey through Rainbow Country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, head over to marktara.com, where everything is connected, and hit the archives banner. To keep up to date with the show, follow me on socials at marktara. The podcast is available on all major platforms, including audible.com and iHeartRadio. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, despite all the craziness that's happening in the world these days, hold true to this. We are living in days of making dreams come true. So believe in yourself. And the world will believe in you. Hi, this is Police Constable Danielle Botno, also known as LGBT Cop, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. Mm.